What's up, guys? This is Nate and Nick at Rooted in Revelation podcast, where we seek to make God's revelation our foundation. Uh, and with us, we have a special guest, Tyler v- Vela. Vela. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. said Vela, but Vela. Uh, what's up, uh, Tyler? Thanks for coming on. Not much. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah. Anytime. Um, so, so you want to share a little bit about yourself and how you know, just how you got in, uh, to becoming a Christian and just kind of a little bit about yourself. Um, yeah. So, uh, I, I clearly, I clearly chose Jesus for myself. Um, <laughs> no, uh, so I was actually really, really quick. I was raised in like a non-Christian home to the point where like, after I became a Christian, like my first Christmas, I was like, Oh, that's what all the Christmas carols are about. All right. I didn't, I had no clue. Uh, and, and, uh, so I, I grew up, I didn't know anything about Christianity. What they were, it wasn't like atheists or anti-Christian. Uh, it was just nothing. It just didn't, wasn't a thing. Um, and as I, uh, as I grew up kind of later high school and into early college, I became somewhat of an atheist. Uh, and it was actually in my first, uh, one of my first classes, I, I was a philosophy major at uh, Sonoma state, which is a secular state school out here in California. And one of my first uh, philosophy classes, uh, once you start getting into the curriculum itself, was uh, was metaphysics. And they go through the arguments for the existence of God as like the first curriculum. And here I have my atheist professor uh, who was who was uh, honest enough to present. He actually did a good job presenting the arguments, the moral argument um, specifically. Uh, and he was like, yeah, we as atheists, you know, here's some of the answers. Here's what we try. But he's like, it, you know, it's a... It, he basically was like, it's a really good argument. And it's not really, he's like, I'm not really satisfied with any of the answers. Uh, and that just like set me reading and researching and my naturalistic worldview started, you know, falling. God, God used that atheistic professor, I think, to, to really hammer away at some, uh, some worldview assumptions that I had. Um, and then, you know, like a lot of stories, there's, there was a girl and she invited me to church and I hated it um my first couple experiences at church I was like this is so boring and so waspy and like oh it was terrible because I grew up in Santa Cruz like surfing listening to punk rock I had blue hair and so going to like a church like a it was pretty it was pretty weird waspy subculture uh but then we went to like a, a college um service at the same church um Dan Kimball was the pastor if you've ever seen Dan Kimball he's like rockabilly his tattoos everywhere which not you know that's not why i believe but it was you know at least it made it it made it easier to sit there and not feel like do do i have to become like this like waspy person to be a christian um and uh and and heard the gospel really clearly for the first time there and uh god used that um not actually even immediately but god used that later that night um, had somewhat of a religious experience that night, um, and uh, and God brought me home from there. Uh, since since then, I've um, been doing because of my background in philosophy. I was always involved in apologetics, um, and and really was was interested even as a uh, you know as a new Christian. I wanted to read all of like the systematic theologies and Bible commentaries and and all of that kind of stuff. So um, so it's, ever since then, I've been doing apologetics and and uh and theology and went on to get my uh degree from moody bible the name you can trust uh at uh in biblical studies and now i'm currently enrolled at the global campus um for reform theological seminary um and i run the freed thinker podcast blog youtube channel facebook group whatever twitter account all that kind of stuff uh, dealing again with, uh, the, with the YouTube is really dedicated more towards apologetics. I don't do a lot of like the in-house theological stuff on there. The podcast is more in-house theological dealing with Molinism and libertarian free will and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, that's me and what I do. Awesome, man. Thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, that's great. And yeah, that's interesting kind of coming out of a, like an atheistic kind of background. So um i was kind of like one of the people that always thought i was a christian but until i became a christian i realized i wasn't a christian yeah like that weird dynamic um but yeah thanks for sharing man so what are we gonna be uh what are we talking about today tyler we are talking about uh how to uh, not get you kicked out of church because we're going to talk about genesis one (laughs) um it's you know a pretty pretty contentious um issue 
for a lot of Christians, which I think is, is, uh, is, I understand why it's important, but I think it's sad how contentious it gets and how people anathematize people for uh, various views on Genesis 1. Um, I understand it more as we get into Genesis 3 and you're starting to deal with this, you know, historical Adam issues and stuff. I, you know, it gets more, I, yeah, I understand because that has more systematic impacts. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're going we're gonna to be talking about that and, and I'm going to try to not get you guys kicked out of your churches, so. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. That'd be very good. Yeah. No, yeah. go crazy. I don't think you have that kind of authority. So yeah. I don't. I do really don't. <laughs> yeah. So all right. So how how do we how do we move forward? Like how do you in, how do you want to go about introducing this topic and and just start rambling away and do your thing, man? Yeah. Um, well, you know, stop me, stop me whenever, because I can ramble on this for a, a long time. Um, <laughs> it really, it, you know, it, it really came out of uh, my background. Um, so I did, I did a, a, a pretty extensive research project um, on, on, uh, on interpretations of Genesis 1. And it really uh, came out of my experience of, uh, you know, originally holding to young earth creationism. Because again, when I became a Christian, I was I was like, oh, I get, you know, I, I it was a uh, not not like a liber literal, um, you know, hyper literal church or anything like that. It wasn't, you know, super fundamentalist, but just as a, you know, as an evangelical Christian, that you just read it. That's just how we read Genesis one, um, and so that's kind of how that was, you know. And I and I had other questions that I was asking and looking for, and so I just kind of that's how we how we read it. Um, but as I started, you know, um, down, down my, my education and studying hermeneutics and um, redemptive historical approaches and historical grammatical hermeneutical methods, um, where we actually are trying to understand um, the, the census literalis or the literal sense, which really, really the literary sense, the, the authorial intent of um, what the author of Genesis 1 would have meant when they wrote it, in the context that they wrote it, who they wrote it to, um, I started to be really, really dissatisfied with a lot of the um, the young earth hermeneutic. Um, and so for for me, the the question about what Genesis one means has nothing, really nothing to do with what does science say? what what is I, I, I've actually as i've as I've gone through this and I've been engaged with a bunch of young earth and old earth creationists, uh, both of them are kind of like, oh, I could actually hold your view and still think because of the science that the earth is young. And I'm like, yes, you, you could. My view actually, my view actually is, if you boil it down, that Genesis 1 just isn't about the age of the earth. Um, it's talking about something else. Um, and so it, it really is compatible with um, a, a young earth view of, of the science or an old earth view of the science because it doesn't really take a stand. It's just is that that's not the question that Genesis 1 is attempting to answer, um, and so, uh, so I, I get I get a lot of people from both sides when they when they kind of it's it's a we, it's a different view. I don't I don't mean it's weird as in like it's bizarre. It's weird as in it's just it's not common. Um, and so I have a lot of you know I've had a lot of conversations where people like flip out because the instant they he, you, they hear um, something like that they think like oh well you're just saying it's all allegory. And I'm like, no, I'm not. And, oh, well, you're just, you know, you're just denying the, the Bible. No, I'm not doing that either. Like, so that, you know, a lot of that comes out from both sides, but I've, I've, just, I've just found a lot of times when people really try to objectively understand the view, ask the questions, look at the data. Um, they, they, you know, a lot of times they'll come around some pretty, pretty staunch younger, uh, you know, advocates and older advocates, and they'll say, oh, yeah, I could actually, I could actually see that. And it, it doesn't even really pose a problem for what I think the science says. So, um, I think it's a, it's been an interesting uh, conversation uh, to have with, with the church, I think. So, so yeah. before we go any further, um, I know we haven't said too much on it yet. Yep. Who would be the historical proponents of your method of interpretation here? Or are you the first guy? No, I'm definitely not the first guy. Um, there are traces of it going all the way back. I mean, if you, if it, it, it's not, it's not, it's not Augustine's view. That's not what I'm saying, but um, well, Augustine, Augustine, I don't know how pedantic people in your audience would be about it. Um, if, if you look at something like his view, he's going to be one that says, well, you know, he, he didn't take it, it literally. He thought, you know, creation was all in an instant. Um, so you have these kind of non, um, these like non-scientific views um, th throughout, throughout all of church, 
if you're talking about like my specific view, um, this is one area where I do admit that that the formulation of it, the the kind of system is systematization of it, really doesn't come around to the early uh, the early 20th century. Um, but some of the larger proponents that you're going to have now are like uh, John Walton, Michael Heiser. I really, um, the if if you read through a lot of academic commentaries, it's going to be something similar to 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 my view. Um, uh, what what let me let me just state really in kind of broad brushes what the view is, um, so we can kind of orientate ourselves. The view is essentially that the, 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 the creation account is a polemic against the, the gods of the ancient Near East. So the gods of Egypt, the gods of Assyria, the gods of Babylon, right? So it's, it's um, and, and, and it's this, this, this idea that God is not actually trying to tell them mechanistically how he created the universe. It's not a scientific account, um, but it's a literary framework. It's, it, it, it is a structured and organized. I actually think this is, this is where, I, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Nick, I, I, that I might kind of uh, blow your mind a little bit. I actually think that it's meant to talk about seven days, regular days, but I don't think it's a literal account of a seven day week. It's just using those con uh, as kind of like hooks for understanding what's actually happening. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's this idea that God has established his temple on the earth. God is the one who rules. God is the one who reigns. It, it, it demythologizes creation. It makes it so, uh, you know, the, the, the sun and the moon, the, it doesn't use the normal days for sun and moon because the, those actually had become deities that were worshipped. And so it just calls them the greater light and the lesser light. It's demythologizing. It's taking kind of the, the religious polytheism out of creation understanding. Um, and, and it's saying, hey, you, you know, you, you, you all think that, um, you know, Ra is the, is the, is the God, it, you know, Yahweh is, is the true God, right? You, you all think um, that Baal is the, is the true God. No, it's, it's Yahweh is the true God, right? So it's, it's really going and, and attacking those other things through the use of polemics. So anyone familiar with like John Currid's work in polemical theology, that's also heavily influencing this. So let me ask a question with this. Yeah. So obvious, so Moses wrote the Pentateuch um, and I'm, I don't know offhand when it was written, um, but it would have been after the Exodus. Mm -hmm. And so they would have had Egyptians with them. So are you saying that this polemic was written for the benefit of the Jewish people as well as the Egyptians or primarily for the Egyptians who came out with them? Because I, I wouldn't think that typically God's people would need a polemic if they had, you know, revelation. Yep. Um, what would you say to that? Yeah, so uh, a, cu a couple of things. So um, first thing is depending on your, I think the view that I hold, there's a couple different variations of it in the literature. Um, and that's going to really depend on, you did hit upon it. It's really going to depend on your view of, it, uh, of, of the authorship of the Pentateuch, um, and whether or not you think Moses wrote all of it, whether or not you think it's from, uh, you know, largely from the pen of Moses, but there's like a mosaic community that follows that does some redactional activity, whether you think that it's mosaic community and then some later redactions during the exile, right? There, there's a bunch of different authorial views. I think the view that I'm advocating is kind of adaptable enough. It, 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 it kind of fits within a bunch of those although with slight, with slight nuances about what the polemics are. When we're talking about polemical theology, and for this, I would really recommend uh, John Currid. He's uh, over at RTS Jackson, I think. Um, he has a book called Against the Gods, um, where he shows that polemical theology is actually all over the Bible. Um, we, we, you read it constantly. And, and one of the biggest examples that he gives, um, I mean, he gives a bunch of them, but like the 10 plagues, each one of the 10 plagues is actually God doing polemics against one of the Egyptian deities. And we talk, I mean, so many people know this, they just don't realize that's what polemics is. You'll, you'll go to, you know, any, any young earth creationist Sunday school, and if they're going through the plagues, they'll show that when you're, when you're going through the, the, you know, the frog plague, that's a polemic against hoppy. Right, the the god the god of the Nile, right? So you you have you have this this intentional kind of visual assault on you think Hopi is the god who protects this. No, no, no. Yahweh is actually the one in control of that. You think that you know uh, uh, Heket, 
uh, protects your it protects your health. No, God's going to give you boils. Yahweh is actually the one that's in control of that. And ultimately, it's it, it really is a conflict between Pharaoh and Yahweh. And so at the very end, uh, well, let me back up. Fa the The Egyptian concept of Pharaoh was that he was the one that actually was uh, in control of what they called ma'at. Ma'at is very, very similar to the Hebrew concept of shalom. It's, it's overall peace and well-being and stability. Um, it's, it's kind of that all-encompassing, everything is right in, in the land type of thing. That was Pharaoh's job, was to protect ma'at. Um, and the way that Pharaoh did it, if you read through the literature, and I have, uh, if, if people go to uh, my, my blog, I'll give you the link to, 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 to share. Um, I've done, uh, you know, like 40 hours of content on all this stuff. Um, there, there's a bunch of references prior to the, the, the composition of, of any aspect of the Pentateuch, even if you take the, the earliest composition of Moses. Where Pharaoh does this, he wins in battle, he protects Ma'at by, by exerting his strong arm or his strong right arm or his right arm or his right hand, some variation of those. And so at the end, when, um, when, 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 uh, when Yahweh wins and, and declares victory and delivers the children, it says, how did God do it? He did it by his strong arm. He brought them out by the might of his hand, right? That is actually taking something that was expressly and only used ever to describe Pharaoh and taking it to God. So they're saying, you think that you think that that Pharaoh is the one that protected everything by his mighty right arm. No, 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 no. Yahweh is the one that has the mighty right arm. Yahweh is the one that protects a nation or destroys a nation. It's Yahweh that is the one that has the, the mighty right arm, right? That's polemical theology. That's taking the idioms and the thoughts or the beliefs of the other one and saying, you think it's this, but it's not. It's actually this. Um, you, you think that it's Pharaoh that has the mighty arm. It's not. It's Yahweh that has the mighty arm. Um, so, and, and it, that's, not, that's not God saying, like, I'm going to now reveal this brand new bit of theological information. It's polemics. It's taking theirs uh, and applying it to Yahweh. And so when we look back at Genesis 1, there is, uh, there, there is an enormous amount of polemics that's happening all throughout uh, all throughout Genesis one, um, and this, by the way, is, is I think very important to understand because this answers, excuse me, this answers a lot of those questions that that Christians are really thrown by when when Christians find out, for example, that um, if you read the Enuma Elish and the Bible and the Enuma Elish, even though the Enuma Elish is like a millennia and a half before anything was written of the Bible. Uh, they have almost identical stories in certain places. Um, it, it, you know, th there's, there, there's clearly these conceptual links between these two where they're telling the same stories. That really freaks a lot of Christians out because they're like, uh, like, are we just stealing other people's myths? And that's what critical scholars want you to think. But if you understand what the Bible is doing and you understand that a lot of times throughout the, it goes all the way through the prophets. When, when the biblical authors are, are taking these and they're, and they're doing polemics and they're saying, you think that, uh, for, for example, you think that Baal is, 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 is the storm God who rides on the clouds and comes and judges nations. No, 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 no. If you get to Isaiah, it's Yahweh that comes riding on the clouds with thunder and lightning and judges. Like it's not, you, you're attributing that to Baal? No, 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 no. It's Yahweh. Yahweh is the true God, right? All throughout. Um, and so I, I think this is actually something that can really help equip the church and answer some of those, some of those objections that we get from critical scholarship. It's, uh, it's really interesting what you're saying, because like you said, I think people know these things, but it, they're not really on the forefront of our mind all the time. Um, and it, it's helpful to have that paradigm to understand that God is constantly showing himself to be the true God against all the false gods in the world. In the world. Uh, you know, I think even like, uh, you know, Elisha um, on top of the mountain when, when God calls down the fire, you know, just some of the more obvious ones. But um, could you walk us through the, the different, you know, gods that you would say God was showing his uh, power over in the creation account to kind of, Help us understand that perspective. Yeah, so um, I think that 
it's you you could view it a couple of different ways. Again, this is where I said that I think depending on one's view of authorship, um, you may you may kind of chronologically locate the polemical somewhere else. Um, and there's enough um, there's enough of that within the text that I think really any of those are viable. Um, so for example, uh, let me find, I, I have this, this structure somewhere. So, so, if I, so if I were to say, okay, what narrative am, am I describing, right? There's, there's, a pre there's a pre-creation condition exists of a watery deep that's just lifeless chaos. Uh, above the waters, there's the breath and the wind that's hovering. There's, the, there's a word of the, God, uh, of the God that creates and announces light. After that, there's a word that brings forth a primordial hill that emerges from the midst of, the, of, that, of, that, of that chaotic water. Uh, creation then produces the sky um, when, it, when it separates that, that water from the water over the earth. There's the formation of the, of the heavenly ocean by that separation. From that, uh, more dry ground is brought forth out of the, the separation. Then the sun is created to rule the world as the image. Uh, after that, earth uh, sprouts plant, pl plants, fish, birds, reptiles, and land animals. Uh, and then uh, th there's the creation of statues and cities and food offerings uh, to God. And then the God rests in satisfaction. What account did I just describe? It's really close to Genesis 1, right? It's actually the Egyptian Shabaka stone. Um, so, so in, in some ways you can look at it and be like, this is clearly a polemical, uh, this is clearly a polemic against the gods of Egypt, um, against the kind of the, the overall worldview and, and creation understanding of, of, of the Egyptian worldview. Um, there are other there are other ways where when you when we look at some of the details and we look at um, the actual the appearance of uh, of of, um, of seven right seven seven is all throughout there's there's heptatic structure it's called it, it, this the sevenfold structure that goes um, throughout uh, throughout all of it so I, I um, excuse me I have this this like list of sevens this will be important in a second. Uh, the, the, the number of seven, uh, there's seven words in the first opening sentence, right? In, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In, in the Hebrew, that's, that's seven words. Uh, in Genesis 1, 2, the pattern is, it's, it's 14 words. Um, in, in, in that, you, you can actually, um, the whole section is, is organized around seven days of, of, of a section. Um, God appears in 30, like all these words appear in multiples of seven. So the word for God appears 35 times. The word for earth appears 21 times. Uh, the word for heavens or firmament 21 times. Um, it was so is seven times. It was good is seven times. And by the way, on, especially on the it was good, sometimes people think, oh, well, that's, that's just kind of a, a byproduct of it being seven days. It's actually not because the it was good doesn't show up on day two. It shows up twice on day three. So they're clearly trying to keep it in there in that sevenfold structure. It's not just kind of a byproduct that this formula follows. You have seven days and you have this formula. So therefore you have seven of them. It's not that case. You have seven days, you have this formula but they skipped a day. And so they make up for it on day three because they wanna keep that sevenfold structure. So you have that there. Um, uh, you, you have the term for light and day appear seven times in the first, first paragraph. There's seven references to light in the fourth paragraph. Um, water is mentioned seven times in paragraphs two and three, right? So, I mean, I, I could keep going. There's literally, like, I have, like, like 20 more of these. We're just in that narrative. There's this, it's just this unavoidable heptatic structure. Why is that important? By the time you get to Solomon, um, and then this follows through into the Assyrian period, the any type of temple uh, establishment of a temple was always done in periods of seven, right? So they they usually were tempted to be to be sac uh, um, uh, sanctified and 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 celebrated and established in they had seven day ceremonies of feast, right? They they were always written about in these kind of seven folds, right? You have you have these sevens always around um, temple texts and, and the establishment of temples. And, and what would happen was when, 
when when the king would ascend to go on a throne or when they thought that the god would 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 sit in in the temple that was always considered the day of rest um and it did it doesn't mean a day of sleep right it doesn't mean that type of rest it meant resting from the work of establishing the throne or establishing the temple and now they take the throne and they start administering their rule right so I, I think that when we look back now at, at, uh, at Genesis 1, and we understand Genesis 1 as this temple text, right, it's showing that God is setting up his garden temple. God is setting up his temple and his rule and his reign, and starting on the seventh day, what does he start to do? Does he sleep? No. He starts to rule and reign over creation with his vice regent, Adam. And the interesting thing about that is when you look at Adam, when, when, um, uh, when, you act, when you start looking at the connections between Adam and say Leviticus uh, or Exodus, right? The terms used for what Adam does to tend and to keep um, are actually, to, the, the words mean like administer and guard kind of. Um, they're the exact same two verbs that were describing the Levitical priests and what they were to do in the tabernacle. Um, and so you have Adam as the garden priest in the garden temple. Um, and so you have this very clear temple text. Um, and you have, you even have the, the physical structure, right? You have, you have the threefold structure going into uh, where you have the outer courts, the inner courts, the whole of holies in the temple and the tabernacle, right? You have the land, the gar uh, sorry, you have the world, the land, the garden, and the garden is where God was, where Adam would come with God and walk with God. Um, and so you have all of these temple themes um, going through going through all of it. Um, and so understanding Genesis 1 as a temple text um, is also very informative. Um, so I hope that kind of answered, that was a very long way of answering that question. No, no, it does. And I, um, <clears throat> yeah, I agree that uh, Gen the Genesis account is, it, the, specifically the Garden of Eden was a temple. Definitely see that in scripture. There's definitely a lot of um, similarities between the garden in, in uh, heaven, you know, how the light was created there and Christ is going to be the light of heaven. We just see a lot of that, um, a lot of similarities there. So I, th I think that is really helpful. And I think I heard there was a prominent Jewish scholar who was asked by a Christian in a lecture, hey, what does the word day mean? How long is a day? And, and yeah. the question kind of threw him because he's like, oh, I don't even, I've never thought about that before. That's not really what the text is pointing to yeah. um and you know I, and i know that uh, you know the days correspond days one and four two and five three and six That's right. and all these things um so i i think it's interesting and i think that um you know i i think i think it's a good point i'm i'm not familiar with the ancient uh positions of the other cultures but um so you would say that your position could be consistent with either an old earth uh format or a young earth format yeah. because it's not so much about you know the the age but a polemic against these other creation accounts Is yeah that right? that, that's right i, I mean it, it's it's like when when um it's like reading uh, what is it, what is it psalm psalm 19 the creation the creation psalm i think it's 19 18 19 um it, it's it's like it's like saying because because we read that psalm and it, it, you know, it's it's not a literal account of creation, right? An old earth can read that, and a young earth can read that, and that's fine. It doesn't really conflict with anything because it's 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 just giving a very beautiful statement that God was creator. Um, I think I think Genesis one is telling us God is the creator. God is the one creator. It's not all these other gods. It's not all the you know the sun and the moon aren't aren't deities that that are that are making things. It wasn't. It wasn't a battle between two gods, or it wasn't it wasn't fornication between two gods, and that that birthed the earth. It wasn't you know, uh, if you, if you read through some of the the uh, the Assyrian myths, um, it wasn't that humans were created because the gods got tired of having to feed themselves, and so they made humans as menial labor to feed and house them. Right? It's none of that. Um, it's it's that that God is setting up. Um, his, his, his tabernacle, his temple to rule and to reign over his creation, um, and that he has established humanity as his royal priesthood to do, to, sure. to, to do that, right? And, and it's not, and it shows that the royal priesthood wasn't created to, as like menial labor. They were created in the image of God, where that's, that's, 
we skip that because that, that's like, that's how we base rights. Like we, we love the idea of the image of God. That was radical back then. The only people that were in the image of God back in like the time of uh, the Egyptians was Pharaoh. That's it. The, no one else, you, n- people weren't images of God back then. You, you were poor and you were slave labor. <laughs> like you did not have value like that. Um, and so it, it really is the, a, a radical paradigm change um, when you understand what the, the polemics is doing. Um, well, it's fine. Oh, go, sorry. Go, no, I, please, go ahead. It was funny when Nate told me we were going to be talking about something uh, and it seemed very old earth, young earth creation. I was like, okay, like this would be an interesting conversation, totally different direction than what I expected. Um, and I'm just going to give my quick plug, my two second plug for why, you know, I've never really looked at the creation account in Genesis as being like the be all end all. Really, I view Exodus 20 verse 11, when God's giving the law and he affirms that this is the NASB for in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. You know, if you're going to take a position of old earth, you'd be focusing on the fact that it's about the sabbath that's fine but but i've always looked at the establishment of the days of creation and the law is kind of the affirmation of the young earth creation account that we get in genesis um but for your position that's not really an issue either way um but so how i i think for your position for anybody who's hearing it for the first time or trying to understand it come to it i know that we anybody who studied a little bit of theology you know we're we're leery of anything that is newer you know anything that hasn't been established for you know at least a thousand years or so um we tend to be leery of because it's why hasn't the church written on it before why hasn't it been an established position and and what would you say to somebody who's thinking those things right now while they're listening Yeah, I mean, I, I would say a couple things. Um, I, it, I I don't actually disagree with the impulse. Um, I, I have I have largely agreed that if if some if a view is new, doesn't mean that it's wrong. But it does mean that we should look at it sideways a little bit, and I'm okay with that. Um, I, I I'm I, I understand that the, I, I will take that burden. I, I understand that if something is 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 not developed until later, we should we should understand that. Now. I also would point out, um, you know, I think I think the three of us are Calvinists, right? Uh, it doesn't mean that that there wasn't Calvinistic Augustinian, we would say Pauline, you know, Christian. It doesn't mean this, but when we, you get to when you get to the Reformation, you have an explosion of systematic development um, that happens where we are now understanding and exploring these. Because what, what people don't realize is that as, as um, thought develop, develops in, in other areas, we start asking different questions. We start asking new questions of things. Um, that's not a bad thing. It, it's it's, it's when, you, when you start, when you always think a certain concept is one thing, but there's a paradigm shift and you start thinking, oh, I have these new set of questions I can ask that. And I can think about it differently, and I can nuance it differently. I can I can systematize it differently now. Doesn't mean that it was it was never there before. It doesn't mean that it was false before. It doesn't mean that you're inventing something new. Um, but it does it does mean um, that that we have kind of some new perspectives um, on on things, and that's okay. The question is, are we getting it? Is it derivative of the text? Um, and I think one of the benefits that came about within the Reformation was really the strong push for a grammatical historical hermeneutic. The, the, the reformers were, the, the big thing was we are not going to rely on Rome. We're not going to rely on the, the bishops and the councils and all that kind of stuff anymore to tell us what the Bible means. We are going to go back and we are going to push for the census literalis. We are going to go back and we are going to find out what Paul meant when Paul wrote uh, the righteousness of God right? That's what kicked off for Luther, right? He wanted to go back and say, what did Paul mean in his context to his audience? Um, and so for, for a lot of us, when, when I'm going back and studying this, and, I'll, and I'll, I actually have some, some things to say about some of those specific, like uh, Exodus uh, 20 and such. When, we're going, when I'm going back and looking at this, I'm going to say, look, I, I'm, not, 
I'm not trying to understand Genesis in the light, you know, I'm not trying to take these, these extra biblical, you know, texts and read them back into the Bible, right? I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to do good historical grammatical methodology. And we all do it when we're trying to understand what Paul meant when he talks about, you know, all Christians are liars, which is a hard passage to deal with. We go back and we say, okay, well, what's, what's, what's going on with the Christians at that time period? Why would he, you know, where does that come from? We want to understand the culture that, that that's driven out of, right? Um, and when we start seeing there's all of these parallels, it's clear that that's something that's in the world and life view that that author is, is drawing on. So the example that I give, and, and, and I don't know, this, this, this doesn't, not, not everyone always gets the reference, but when, when my first son was being born, someone asked me how I was feeling. Like we were, we were, about, we were on our way to the hospital and I said, oh, we're five minutes to midnight. Do you guys get the reference? Not everyone does. So, okay. I think uh, what you're saying is it's, we're almost at the hardest part. Yeah, so five minutes to midnight is actually a reference to the doomsday clock, right? During the Cold War, the, 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 you know, I think it was Time Magazine had this doomsday clock and the closer the tensions got, you were closer to midnight. You could actually, they would publish how close uh, to midnight we were. And so it's this statement of this, this kind of, this, this allusion to, if I say it's five seconds, to, you know, five minutes to midnight, I'm alluding to this prior idea, this prior image that, that people who grew up in the Cold War have referenced to that were really close to this cataclysmic life-changing event, right? Um, if someone were to go back, you know, a thousand years from now and to go back and, and try to understand what I, what I meant, and they said, oh, well, you know, he says this thing, there's this doomsday clock and all that kind of stuff. Would someone, would, would someone else look at that and be like, yeah, but you need, you know, you're taking this outside image and you're imposing it on what Tyler said. Well, well no, because that's part of, that's part of how I grew up. That's part of what, what I understand. That's the idioms in my culture and in my surrounding culture that informs how I think and talk about things. So that's, we're doing the same thing with when we're trying to understand Genesis one within that context. Um, the, the, let me let me actually kind of put, let me let me shift gears a little bit if it's okay, um, because I because I also want to point out that I'm trying very hard to understand the Bible within the Bible and to do consistent hermeneutics, um, and so uh, uh, and and this will I'll get to your your Exodus 20 as 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 part of this. Um, a lot of times when we're dealing with this, there's a certain hermeneutic. Um, that that you do have to reject, um, and I and I so I I try very hard not just present my position. I try very hard to put my hermeneutic and that I'm using up on display so people can investigate that. But I also need to display in order to hold this view, there is a certain type of hermeneutic that you do have to reject, um, and that is a kind of quasi dispensational literal hermeneutic which is that unless, unless something is clearly not literal history, you have to read it as literal history. Um, we're, we're all reformed here. That should be an easy thing for us to say that we reject that. Um, but but I, I find sometimes when, when dealing with this specific issue, even reform folks will kind of go towards that. Um, and so there is a sense where I'm going to say, we, we can't look at it and say, well, unless, unless, you know, this is a Psalm, um, it's clearly literal history. Um, that, that simply isn't the case. And I'm going to give some, some, some examples of, of, of why, um, the, 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 pro there, there are a few problems, right? So I think there are indicators that the passage is less than, less than, straightforwardly literal history. Why do I say that? You have some certain issues um, that, that arise from that type of reading, right? You have something like um, light before the sun exists. Now, a lot of young earth creationists will be like, oh, well, are you saying that God can't have light? That can be the supernatural light, all this kind of stuff. I don't mean it as the crass, well, there just is, there's just a problem with there's light before the sun because the sun can be the only source of light. I mean, I have a lamp sitting on my desk. I know that's not the case, right? 
Um, the problem with it is that when you read day one, the way that God makes the light is by separating the light from the darkness. Um, it's a definite articled, they're definite articled nouns. It is the light from the darkness. It's not just kind of abstract light and darkness. Um, and at the end of the first day, God calls it good, right? You have morning and evening the first day, God calls the light good. On day four, you have the same formula. God separates the light from the darkness. Do you, I, I don't know if you see the obvious tension. God already separated the light from the darkness. Like when did it fuse back, right? Because he separates the light from the darkness again. If the, if, if the light in the beginning one was good uh, for, for governing morning and evening, then why did God have to recreate it on the fourth day, right? Because if it was good and functional, it seems like God's like, well, two days later, I'm going to scrap that and start over again with a new light, which causes issues. And we're told specifically. Um, so sometimes young earth creationists will, be, will say things like, um, uh, I should say, I should say 24 hour literalists. I shouldn't say young earth creationists. I should say those who hold the 24 hour view. They'll say, oh, well, you know, a, a, a day just is, you know, you, you don't need the sun to have a, a, a total rotation on the earth's axis, which is true. But notice there's more, there's evening and there's morning. That just is the differentiation of light throughout the day. Um, right. And we're told on day four that the, that God created the sun and the moon to do that, right? To mark out days and hours and seasons, right? And so we're told on day four that God created the thing that would do that differentiation of morning and evening and calls it good, right? Again, I'm not saying that this is like a definitive case. I'm saying these are these are markers that something else is going on in the passage. Sure. Uh, and I think it's called the the framework theory or whatever i forget yeah. but it's yeah, that framework. god it's that he creates the the um the substance of a thing and then he creates how that substance is going to be uh you know fleshed out so um, formed and filled what's it filled correct yeah for, formed and filled or creature cre the you know the kingdoms and then the the kings is sometimes how it's described yeah 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 well i would just say that on the fourth day and i may have misunderstood you i wouldn't say that god made light again on the fourth day but he made uh you know let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens it's not light itself but it's they would be the things that basically function as how the lights are being worked into creation. So again, I, I don't, I don't know any young earth creationists who would phrase it quite like you did. Um, but you know, that, that might be just pedantic and a smaller point. So. Yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, I think there, I would have response. I don't want to go into like response and response all that kind of, for all these sure, sure. I think there are responses to that. My only point is, is simply that there are, there, there are there are these indicators that something else is happening, right? Um, when when you read through, when you start getting into Genesis two, and you start getting into the, the order, um, it seems that you have uh, you have man being created even before plants. Um, you, you you have you have some of these you have enough of these little inconsistencies um, that that there's there's lots of questions that seem to have these little these, there's these indicators that that something else is is going on. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I, I would start to look at those. And, and by the way, I should add, when, when I, when I want to be consistent, right, I, I want to make sure that I'm not just being consistent within one passage. I'm being, in, I'm being consistent with, with my hermeneutic across the board. So I, I often point this out to people, is that when we really, some of these views, these kind of like the, these, these, I call them scientific views, really they're, they're views on material creation in Genesis 1. They want to they want to try to get our astronomy and our geology from the text, but I often point out you really don't want to get your anatomy from the Bible, though, right? There, there, and, and people don't realize this because our English Bibles have really, really helped us. All throughout the Bible, when we read heart and mind, the Old Testament authors did not think heart and mind. They were not they, that is not the words they used. Right? They do not think you think with your mind and you feel with your heart. Now, we all understand heart is like an image, but we, we, th that's not what they thought. They thought the seat of your being was your bowels and you thought with your kidneys. 
literally the organ is your kidneys. Uh, and so when it says God placed his law on your hearts, he, he placed his law on your kidneys, right? And so the question I have is, okay, if we're supposed to read it literally, are you going to say, you know, forget you, Gray's Anatomy, like, like I, I don't need my brain, I need my kidneys, right? Paul, even up to the time of Paul, when Paul says, you know, I, I have all of the great affection for you in Philippians, it's I, it's I have the affection of my bowels, right? Which kind of makes sense because when you're really nervous about something, you, you feel it in your guts, right? But, but we don't, we don't look at that as, as to, you know, we don't, we don't take the same type of literal hermeneutic with that and say, oh, well, you know, doctors are just using secularist, you know, science anatomies and they want to deny, we don't do that, right? We say, oh, well, that was how they understood it. And so God was being incarnational. He wasn't trying to correct their anatomical understanding. He was trying to convey to them that he's going to, where, wherever they think that the seat of the person is, God's not trying to give them an anatomy lesson. He's saying, wherever you think that is, that's where I placed your heart. Keep it at the core of your being, right? That's the point, right? We don't do this kind of weird literal thing. But for some reason with Genesis 1, we do that. Um, and, and, and we try to get our, our, our astronomy and our geology and we say, well, if it's, not, if it's not literal, well, you're just giving into secular science. And, and I'm like, well, one, I'm not even trying to understand the science, but no. Um, and, and they'll say, well, if, if you're not saying it's literal history, you're saying it's, you're saying it's just all allegory, right? And, and I'm saying, well, well, well no, in, in the same way that I can look at something like Deborah's song in Judges 5 or Moses' song of deliverance in, in, in Exodus 15, these are, these, are, these are epic poems. They are telling us actual history, right? They're not telling it in the right order necessarily. And they're not giving it to us in, in kind of literal historiographic terms. Um, but they're telling us, we're not going to look at it and be like, well, it's just crass allegory then. We, like, we, we, you know, we, just, we just read it all as symbol. That's not, so, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a black and white, either something is literal history or it's allegory. That, that's, that's a really big false dichotomy within kind of a, a literal, how, how these kind of really literalistic hermeneutics operate. So would you say, you'd obviously affirm as, as we would, that the uh, Adam and Eve account is historical. Yes. But would you be consistent, and I'm not saying you're inconsistent if you, if you wouldn't agree with what I'm about to say, but would you say that even the account of Adam and Eve isn't like literal in the sense that a lot of us would read it, but it's giving us a general picture, just like, um, you know, it's not a literal six days, it's just giving us a general, you know, idea, understanding. Um, I, so I, I think that what happens is, and I, and I, a lot of people don't know what to do with the primordial history. Like you, 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 know, you kind of have conservatives that are like, it's literal historiography all the way through. You have liberals that are like, oh, it's just made up myth-making all the way through. I think that actually we see this very, so I, I should preface this by saying, I think that I, I hold to a view of uh, core mosaic authorship with redaction by mosaic community either, you know, Aaron or Joshua or people that were close to Moses. I think that the composition of the Pentateuch specific, you know, in general and Genesis in, in specific is the, the literary brilliance of it is like the more I study it and the more I study the structures of it and all the little chiasms and the, and the chiasms within chiasms. I mean, it's just the literary genius of it uh, is breathtaking. One of those things that I think it does, you see this similar in the book of Judges, where Judges actually has kind of a literary unraveling that happens. So if you follow the, 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 the story of Judges, where you have, you know, uh, this judge saved this many people and is effective for a lot. Um, and then after that, it was this judge and they were effective for this. They say this many and it was effective for this long. And it was this many and this long until finally Samson basically just delivers himself. Like there's this kind of Israel because they're without a king kind of circling the toilet bowl and going down. The literature of it, actually, the chiasms also kind of start to unravel as it goes. Right. So the, the, there's this like the literature is part of the paintbrush that the author is using. It's brilliant. Um, the same thing I think is happening in Genesis, where as the structure is driving towards Abraham, 
you start to get more and more concrete events being described and you get less and less theologizing that's happening. So I think what you have is in Genesis 1, I think God literally created the universe. I think God really created his garden temple. I think, you know, all that kind of stuff. I don't think, I think it's done in, in beautiful literary prose. I think it's done in, in a kind of theolo theologized polemical retelling of it. I don't think we have to get, you know, seven days literal out of it. By the time you get to the garden there, you know, it's a little bit more historic, but I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, theologizing that's happening at that point. And it goes and it goes down to that point. So I, I, I don't, I would look at it and I'd say, I mean, I, I absolutely think there's a historical Adam and Eve. Totally think there's a historical Adam and Eve. Um, there's other questions that come about like, you know, death before the fall and, and well, did, you know, when it says that he made Adam from, from the dust of the earth, is it really that he picked up, you know, dirt from the ground and used that kind of mechanistically to create Adam? Or is it that he was, you know, it came from something else? You know, there, there's, there's some other questions around that. But there's very clearly a historical Adam and Eve that are the covenant heads um, for all humanity. Um, and you get more and more concrete as it goes. I don't know if that kind of answers your question. I, I mean, I understand from, from your perspective that it does. I guess I just, you know, I just don't understand um, why, like, what would be the justification for saying that, like, as you move inward from... The beginning of scripture to abraham that things are you're doing less i think you said theologizing mm -hmm. and and it can be more literal like um to from and i'm not trying to be rude but it just seems like from my perspective because and i've never heard this before in the way you're presenting it but it seems like um it's very convenient for the argument for the position yeah i understand that i and i it, there there are a lot of again if you if you go back the I give a ton of research and a ton of examples in in the in in all the the the, the programs that I've done. Um, so let me give you let me give you some examples. So in Genesis one, you have not only kind of that heptatic structure that I was talking about, um, where you have all these repetitions of seven. Everything is very tightly literal, uh, literary. Sorry. So the whole structure is is you have that framework structure where day one and day four, day two and day five, day three and day six. Um, you you have very very clear the number of uh, of words and sentences. It's very very it's very literary um, and and very thematic. When you get into Genesis two and three, that starts to unravel a little bit, right? You don't have it's not as tightly wound that way. But you have uh, things like Eden and West show up in, in multiples of seven. Adam and man show up 28 times. Man and helper show up 21 times. Um, the, the root word for to eat shows up seven times in a paragraph describing the fall. Um, the verb to take, which actually has a lot of like narratival significance, uh, appears seven times. There, there seems to be from in, in that in the garden in the garden story in, in chapters two and three, really from two four to the end of three. Um, there's seven kind of uh, remember Hebrew doesn't have like paragraphs and scansions. Like sure, sure. Have. There's seven natural breaks in the story, however, um, that go through. So you kind of have this. You still have some of that literary driving happen, but it's already unraveled a little bit from the first one. So basically, it just it qualitatively looks different to somebody who's reading the Greek because like, and admittedly, this is a frustration of mine because I I'm sorry Hebrew, because um, I don't know Hebrew, so I can't look at that text and be like, okay, I can see, you know, the the number of words are corresponding with kind of everything else, the number of days and and all these things. So um, you know, I I think from the from how you're explaining it now, I'm starting to see some of the things you said earlier coming together that are that make that position uh that shore that up a little bit um so yeah no that was helpful yeah uh i mean you, you and, and and again i give ref i give a lot of references but like um you can look at like scholars like levinson and casuto and 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 uh and, and gordon um uh, Wenham and 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 a bunch of others that, that are talking about this type of thing um very good question though very, i mean that's very helpful so uh you know some some of the other things that that we want to look at that that we, I've, I've found in talking with a lot of people also there, there's supports for a, a, a very literal reading that, that they've been told and so it undergirds their view, but they're just not good supports. Uh, 
so for example, um, you know, a lot of people will be told that, you know, ordinal and cardinal numbers when they're paired with the term yom always mean a 24 hour day. Um, that simply is, that, that just simply isn't the case, right? Um, I'm actually trying to find my, my reference to it. Um, uh, oh, here it is. So, uh, so they'll, they'll say things like when, when you have an ordinal number, right? First, second, third, fourth, or you have a cardinal number, one, two, three, four. Uh, whenever it's paired with the, with, the, with the word yom in the Bible, it always means a 24 hour day. And so therefore they'll say, well, we have that in Genesis one, therefore those have to be 24 hour days. I'll say two things. First of all, again, if you remember, I think the author is using a, a regular day just as the, the, the way that it's organizing the structure. So I don't have a huge problem with that. My issue is it's just false. Um, it's just not the case. I mean, we have, we have a bunch of examples. So uh, in, in Hosea 6.2, right, we read, after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. What that's referring to was the restoration of Israel. We know for a fact that those were not two, you know, that wasn't two literal 24-hour days that there was a restoration of Israel, right? That, that took a huge amount of time. Um, in in uh, Deuteronomy 10.10, 10, it reads, I myself stayed on the mountain at the first time, 40 days and 40 nights, and the Lord listened to me uh, also at that time. That clause at the first time is uh, an ordinal number first with yom. But he says at the first time, the first yom was 40 days and 40 nights. So we know that that, that doesn't mean one 24-hour day was 40 24-hour days. Um, and so we, uh, and I have a bunch more of these. We have clear examples where, it, where, where you have ordinal and cardinal numbers with the word yom that do not, we just know they aren't 24 hour days and that's okay. And again, that doesn't prove the literal reading false. It just means that that's a really bad way to try to support it. Another one is when they say things like the, the Vav consecutives construction is a marker that, uh, of, of, uh, of Hebrew historical narrative. Right? It just means when you see the Vav consecutive construction in the Hebrew, um, it, it's a Vav consecutive plus an imperfect verb. Um, if you read through the Hebrew, it's and then, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then this. Right? And they'll say that that, that, that means that it's, that it's historical narrative, uh, that it's literal history. Um, the problem is that, again, that's just not the case. Right, so so we have the Vav consecutive shows up seven times in Moses's song in Exodus 15. That's a that's an epic poem. It's not a historical narrative. My favorite one is the Vav consecutive shows up as the main driver of the narrative. You know Jotham's parable in Judges nine, where he compares the brothers to the to the to the grove of trees getting together. It's this whole parable. That entire parable is driven by the Vav consecutive construction, right? That does, th does that mean that we should read it, that there's these literal groves of different types of trees that are like five? No, it's, a, it's, it's clearly a parable, um, right? So, so it's just not the case. What the Vav consecutive does in Hebrew is that it moves a, a, um, it moves a plot line, right? So it is the case that it moves action along, but it's not the case that you can look at it and say, therefore we read this as literal history. Right. So, so again, that, that's one where, you know, when, when you listen to some people like Jason, and again, I, I respect these people, I, you know, I think they're, they're great brothers, but when you listen to people like Jason Lyle um, or, or others who, who, who say these types of things, it's just factually incorrect. Like no, no, Bi no actual Old Testament scholar would, would make these arguments because it's just, all you have to do is use, you know, use a lexicon and you can find out these are wrong. Um, but they're big supports to try to get these through. Uh, the other one, and, and you brought this up, uh, uh, Nick, when, when you asked about Exodus 20. Um, that's a really important one. The question is, is Exodus 20 telling us that it has to be, you have to read it as 24 uh, literal days. Again, 24 hour literal days. Again, I'm okay with thinking that Genesis 1 is just using a regular day as the, as the framework for it. So that's fine. I, I mean, he can, if he's talking about 24 hour days in Exodus 20, he can appeal to that all he wants. That doesn't, I don't think that that imputes the time frame from Exodus 20 back into Genesis 1. But I actually think the better understanding is that the whole point of it 
is that there is this, there's this paradigm of six plus one um, because the, the justification given in Exodus 20 isn't just for the Sabbath day. It also justifies the Sabbath years. Um, so it, it justifies that paradigm of six work, one rest. You get that for the, the, the every seventh year, and then you get it for the Jew, year of Jubilee, the 49th year, right? So th that, that same paradigm, I think, I think it's the paradigm that's actually be, being driven out, not necessarily the, the length of the, the literal days that are, that are happening in there. Um, so I don't know if that, that helps. Again, and there can be back and forth and back, you know, the, you know questions, well, what about this? All that can happen, and, and, I, and, I, and I handle a bunch of that in the, in the literature. But I, I think that it's just, it's not as simple um, as a lot of people would say, oh, well, you know, in Exodus 20, it says, uh, as you create it in six days, um, there's other things that are happening um, throughout that. Right. Well, um, for any listeners, uh, you know, we're having a one hour to two hour conversation with Tyler here. We're, we're definitely not going to tease out all the content that he's written on and all the all the arguments that he can make for his position so uh you know definitely check him out um i i personally it takes me a little while to uh ruminate on uh on new ideas and things because i tend to be pretty strong on what i believe so i you know but what what you're saying is interesting and i particularly have never heard because I've, I've argued with old earth creationists before um i had a guy who I respect tell me, Oh, you're the, you're the first young earth creationist that I've ever had, a, that, that's ever had cogent arguments with me. I'm like, well, you need to talk to some new people, I guess then, cause I'm not that impressive, but, um, but it's interesting, you know, the point that you're making that, yeah, that, that the, the day is necessarily may not be the exact point of the text. So for any listeners who, you know, feel very strongly about these things, you know, your position kind of creates this, and obviously, you know, it's not the justification for it, but it creates this middle ground where we can kind of come together and say, oh, okay, well, was this, was the point of this text for God to say, this is how many days he made everything in, or was he conveying the fact that he is really God over all these other false gods? Um, it also kind of makes me think though, how um, Michael Horton talks about Caesarean treaties um, yeah. in the ancient Middle East. And he kind of makes the argument, you know, well, did God basically take, did, did the biblical authors take the idea of the Caesarean Treaty and apply it to the Garden of Eden in, in God's uh, covenantal structure with Adam? Or did the world exist like that because of the Garden of Eden and because of God and Adam? And it kind of makes, gives me the same question here, yep. you know, um, regarding regarding the structure of the other creation myths you know did did the these other creation myths exist because of the true creation account that was then just um you know changed or bastardized by these other religions or these uh, these other people groups um have you ever thought about that yeah yeah th that's a, a such an insightful question i mean that's that, that's very very good uh, I, 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 it wasn't Michael Horton. I can't remember who it was, but someone was like, you know, they, they, they didn't use covenant. They used marriage and, and, uh, they were like, okay, well, is marriage there in the Bible? Where we're talking about like the marriage supper of the lamb was God like, oh, well, marriage is really big with these people. And so I'm going to talk about marriage or do we have marriage because God instituted it, um, for, for our good and for, you know, for all that kind of stuff. I, I think that's a very, very good example with, with covenant. Um, and, and, I, I lean towards, we have covenants because God has made us in our image and God just is a covenantal being, right? I mean, I, I hold the covenant theology. So I think there was the pactum salutis. I think there was a covenant between, not, not necessarily a, you know, a Susan tree treaty, um, but there, there was a covenant between the father, son, and the spirit in eternity past. I think God just is a covenantal being. Um, that, that God works in covenant. And so he, he ordered his creation to follow covenant. What I think is interesting, and, and this actually, um, I don't talk, this, this, you, we're now like in the weeds, um, but I'm glad you brought it up because I get the opportunity to say it because I think this is another example where th this actually supports the view is that if you think of Genesis two and three, and you think of the covenant that God made with Adam, 
and we want to talk about it as a, it, it's it's a suzerainty treaty, right? It's it's a it's a it's a suzerain and a vassal. It's a higher king and a lower king. Adam is a king. He's a kingly priest, right? What what has to if that came out of nowhere, and you were like, I don't know who these people are, <laughs> we wouldn't understand the covenant. What happens in Genesis one is God showing this is my garden temple. I am the great king. I am the one in authority. I am the ruler. I am, I have created all of this for my good purposes. I have established my throne. I am sitting, I am ruling, I am resting. Now, when he goes to Adam and says, hey, I have, a, I have this covenant with you now, now it makes sense. We're like, oh, of course, the greater king is going to the lesser king and imposing this Susan Tree Treaty on him. Um, so it, that, that actually is, I think, a very important aspect of understanding what's even happening in the text and understanding there is kind of, we understand why, why creation, you know, why you have to have creation before you have Adam, because Adam has to be created. But theologically, why is Genesis 1 before Genesis 2? And it's because it's the covenant prologue. It's showing us who the parties are in the upcoming covenant. Um, and I think that that's a really important thing to understand that's happening in the text as well. Yeah, I, I got uh, real go quick because I, I don't think I asked my question as well as I meant to. So my, my question was more along the lines of like, uh, so like for a, for a Suzerian treaty, um, some people think would make the argument that God structured it, the biblical authors structured it after the normative ways they did things oh, in okay. that area at that time. Okay, um, you know, I, what, I think I understand your question. You're, you're, you're asking, it, uh, is it written that way because that's how those people understood covenant or is it is it that way because god established covenant first so therefore we understood what covenant is i guess more pointed in the context of uh the argument that the creation account is a polemic against other religions mm -hmm. I, I think um what i'm trying to say is that were did other religions take our creation account and modify them after because these were verbal traditions yeah. would they have taken our verbal traditions and modified them and then they became you know accounts that were opposed to the truth of christianity because i i think if that were the case you know the basis for the polemic against it unless god was looking into the future and doing those things preemptively you know just isn't as strong so i'm just curious if you know if anybody's ever written on that or talked about that does that, did that make more sense? Yeah, I think so. Um, so there, there, there is, there is some, there is some writing on. It. So the, there is this idea that, well, the reason why, you know, Mesopotamians have the Enuma Elish in the flood account, is because the flood happened, and so of course they have their own account of it, and the but the Hebrews get the inspired account of it, right? There, there, there's a reason why. Um, in, in Aboriginal, I, I think it's the Aboriginal, there's some Aboriginal account like in, in New Zealand or something um, that has the story of like two first humans that are like, you know, tempted to eat something. It's a very, very similar to the garden. They're gonna say, okay, well, that story has just traveled, right? Because it's, because it's sort of a historical account. That's possible. Um, I, I, I'm not in principle opposed to that. That could very well be the case where, where some of those came from. The issue is that when we get to the biblical text, we know that some of these other texts existed first before the biblical text was written. Um, and that the biblical text, it's not just that the, like the narrative and the themes were similar. It actually sometimes seemed to take kind of a whole cloth, the structure of it, the, the, um, the, the language of it, the terms. So for example, uh, in my paper, I give um, uh, some of the examples. So the, the Egyptian account of creation, um, when it talks about, um, when in the Hebrew, we talk about tohu vabohu, right? Empty, empty and formless, right? In the Hebrew one, there was, it was boundless and indifferentiated, right? And it uses, it uses some derivative terms. Um, in the Hebrew, it's, it's kosek, there's darkness that was there. In, in, in the Egyptian, it's keku, which the, the kind of, infinite darkness, like darkest of darkness, like obscure darkness type of meaning. Um, in the Hebrew, there's tehom, which is the watery deep. 
Um, in the Egyptian, it talks about the nun, the, <clears throat> the primordial water. So it's not simply that, and there's, there's dozens of these, right? It's not simply that they had the same kinds of stories, right? There very, very clearly seems to be um, structural and lexical borrowing that happens. Um, and if that's the case, it's very hard to say that the earlier one like somehow borrowed from the later one. So, e so even if we wanna say that, well, the reason why, you know, the, the Enuma Elish talks about the, the flood narrative, right? In very, very similar ways, similar terms, similar structure as, Gen as Genesis six, right? Is because there's this historical event that happened that they're both drawing from. That's, that, that's all fine and well. The issue is, okay, but there's actual like lexical borrowing and, and structural borrowing that seems to happen where one text seems to actually be relying on the other text as a source in the same way that we would look at something like Mark and Priority and we see actual like borrowing from Mark in Luke and Matthew. Um, and we would say, well, you know, the fact that the structure is the same and some of the terms are the same seems to indicate that Mark was a prior source that Luke and Matthew used. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, no, that's interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank you for going into that. You were saying something, Nate? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll try the talk now. I've been napping over here. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, your eyes are open. Yeah, yeah. Unless you can sleep with your eyes open. Yeah, so I'm just like, I'm like thinking, okay, what would a, a young earth creationist be thinking right now? And or, or like or uh, older. Or, or, older. or old earth, right? Yeah. And they both are, are what's been called concordists. They both read Genesis one as a, an account of material creation. Right. Yeah. So what I mean, so you mentioned like um this very literal reading. Like where where like I'm just saying, like, what's the history behind? Is it just because us in the West read things that way? Like, cause it it makes a lot of sense to my brain that ancients are gonna write more in like a imagery typology kind of structure and what they're explaining not necessarily the way we see things like i have one pepsi and i have one coke therefore i have one pepsi and one coke and like back then i feel like they would there'd be more artistic formulations of how they're describing their their points or more in like a, a parabolic sense or more in a typology or you know what i mean like so that makes sense to me like it makes sense why we don't have to be petrified because if oh no if you don't have a literal seven days you don't have a historical atom therefore you're a heretic uh or something like i feel like a lot of times even with like answers to genesis a lot of these guys like you know they're good guys and sure and everything but like i've never been too persuaded by because they kind of set like up like a false dichotomy like these two choices you have to make and i'm like well they're both wrong in my head like i don't feel like i have to affirm this or deny the thing you're putting me in the situation that you know, to deny or form, uh, de to deny or affirm the kind of false economy that's set before me. Like, I feel like why, I mean, can it be both and can it be like, if it's not really about how many days or whatever, like at then, like, I just feel like, why don't we just affirm what the Bible affirms for our hermeneutics and just be okay with that. I don't know why we're so dead set on this literal seven day and or uh, billions of years. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, and that, and that's it's an. I mean, you have to realize. Um, it, I'm very sympathetic to to young Earth and old Earth positions. It's a very natural way to try to read the text. I I totally get it. I, you know, I, I I'm not one of those people like uh, that thinks like, oh well, like young Earth creationists are dumb or like. I don't think that at all. I, you know, I I. I have, you know, I have some very, very close friends. I, I've done, I've done episodes in response with like Steve Schramm, with Turretin fan. I love these guys. I think they're brilliant. I think they're trying to be responsible with the text. I totally get why, you know, it's one of those things where like I read it and I'm like, I understand why you read it that way. It's not, it's not crazy or anything like that, right? I totally get it. Um, I just think that when we're doing, you know, a kind of a consistent, uh, I, I just think it's more consistent, I should say. I shouldn't say when you're doing consistent as if they're not being or not trying to be. I, I just think it's more consistent to a historical grammatical method, which, is, which really is you know, the, the driving force, force within Protestantism uh, as our hermeneutic. I really think that 
Um, it's just more consistent to try to read it this way and understand it this way. Again, the same way where I do that with, you know, understanding, I don't think with my kidneys, right? But I under, but I understand, um, I understand why that's in, why that's in the Bible. I understand that God's not trying to give them anatomy lessons. I understand that he's not trying to give them cosmolo cosmology lessons either. Um, and that, and that's okay. I think that, that really what's happening is, is God is telling them who he is, that he, he is the one true God. Again, you know, if you're, if we're taking a, a mosaic or, um, a, a mosaic, um, a community view, authorship view, which I think, you know, none of us are, you know, none of us are going to go down with like Velhausen and the documentary hypothesis and all that kind of, we're not, li we're not liberals here. Um, we're going to look at that and we're going to say, okay, I mean, who was this primarily written to? It's, pro it's most likely written to Israel sitting in, you know, the plains of Moab, getting ready to enter the land. They have a whole, you know, a, 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 Nick, as you pointed out, you have a whole bunch of, uh, you know, Egyptians with them. And they're talking about the, 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 what's the main emphasis when, when you uh, uh, of the law, what is the biggest problem that's happening before going into the land? It's syncretism over and over and over again. When you get there, guys, when you get there, don't worship their gods, even if it means, and this is going to, you know, this is the hard part a lot of people struggle with, even if it means you have to kill them off so that you're not tempted to intermarry and to worship their gods right? You need to have purity. Yahweh is Yahweh. If you give false, you know, if you use false fire, Phineas is going to kill you with a spear, right? God, Yahweh is the true God. Syncretism, not okay. What should we expect then as a main theme from the very beginning? Syncretism, not okay. God is the one true God. God is the creator God. God is the one sitting on the throne. There are no other gods creation is not a bunch of deities, right? You have these major themes because he's writing to, yeah, you have a bunch of Israelites, but it's not like a bunch of, you know, it's not like Israelites were the best monotheists throughout history. And you have a bunch of syncretistic Egyptians with them. Of course, when Moses or the Mosaic community is writing this, that's going to be a major, major theme from the get-go. Great. Well, I have learned a lot. I've never even heard of this position. Never, uh, never really considered it in the way that you presented it. So uh, I think I think it's interesting, and I think that uh, I look forward to reading whatever you've done. And uh, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, why are you sounding like this is over, Nick? This is, I mean, we got. Well, it's over. I gotta go because I I promised my family I would uh, spend time with them. So. Good for you. That was oh, my soft goodbye. A, but, good, um, a good Joel Beaky disciple. Go lead your family, brother. Yep. All right. Well, uh, blessings with the remainder of the conversation. And uh, Tyler, it was a blessing to meet you. And uh, to our listeners, thanks. And I'll catch you next time. Thank you. It was great meeting you. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, bye, Nick. He's gone, but whatever. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I was just always like pretty dissatisfied with kind of the whole old earth, young earth, because I'm just like, I, I, I just never in my brain did it seem like what they both wanted to push was really the issue. Um, uh, yeah, I, I see why conservatives would kind of like had red, have the red flags like coming up because they're just like, oh, man, like if you don't have this as a historical thing, then you don't have like I get the logic, like you said, like then therefore maybe Adam and Eve aren't really. Adam and Eve, and then it messes with, you know, original sin. It messes with uh, the second Adam being Christ. I mean, it, I could see why people would be very hesitant yeah. and very actually terrified to ever, you know, just that's liberalism, get rid of it, push it away. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so because, and, and, and I'm, I'm very aware that there are, the, that there are landmines that you have to avoid in some, I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally aware of that. But it somewhat reminds me, I don't, I don't know if this will get me in trouble. It somewhat reminds me of, um, because, because they're, they're like, oh, well, you know, liberals could really use that. So let's stay away from it, right? Let's, let, it's, it's kind of like the Pharisee thing, like there's the law, but we don't want to get too close to it. So let's make the law a hedge, you know, 20 yards further out to, to even avoid getting close to it. Um, and the same thing happens in, you know, I, I, I commonly point out like like ancient Israel, um, it was a theocracy, but uh, it was 
it was rather communistic. Um, if you think, of, I, I mean, the, the government really at the time and, and God legislated, you, you can't harvest the corners of your field because you have to let strangers come onto your private property and take the food that they want, right? Like American Christians would lose their minds if, if the government tried to say like, hey, you have, your, you have this land or you have your business, you can't profit actually from you know, a quarter of your business. You have to let total strangers come in in need and just take it. Right, Americans would lose our minds. We'd be like, "Well, that's communism." We'd we'd flip out. But but I want to look at it and be like, "Well, okay, does that mean we shouldn't say that that was true of Israel because it could lead to people saying, therefore, we should endorse communism?" I mean, no, it, of course not. It's it, you know, we, there 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 are some there are some pretty radical things in the Bible, and that's okay. And the liberals tend to just take them and run crazy with them. And rant. that's the problem. It's not that there's this kind of core problem. So, yeah. Yeah. And it, it yeah, I, and I get it like at the root of it, it's like, you know, being a, you know, a Vantillian myself and some sort of moderate camp of that. Um, I, I, I see like, you know, the framework of just, you know, there's no neutrality and I'm thinking, okay, like, I get the logic behind that, but I just don't really think that kind of thinking necessarily has to apply to like a young or old earth situation. You know what I mean? Cause it just yeah. doesn't seem like the main point. Um, yeah, there, there, there is kind of a, I, you know, I think uh, I, I'm not going to name names, but there are some people who are, are kind of, I've, I've called them they're, they're It's not necessarily, it, it's not usually a fault on the old earth creationist side. I think the old earth creationists are used to having to defend their view there is kind of this presuppositional young earth creationist position almost where it's like, if you reject my, if you reject young earth creation, you're just rejecting the Bible. And they're, they're, they're missing this step of, this is my view of what the Bible is teaching. Um, and, and so if you reject that, like th there's this, there's this almost like we presuppose this position. And so you have to take that position. If you reject it, then you're rejecting the Bible. And I'm like, no, you're skipping a lot of steps there. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think part of the reason for that is there, there's, um, in, especially in the West, there, is, there, there was a strong push uh, after the fundamentalist controversy um, in, in the, you know, the 1920s or so to wed conservative fundamentalism with a capital F with, uh, with creationism. Um, and and uh, there, there's a there's a book by a, a historian of science named called Ronald Num his name's Ronald Numbers and he wrote a book called The Creationists, and it actually shows the rise of creationism and creation science in Western evangelicalism, um, and these types of these types of uh, like in-house battles about creation and the fervency that that a lot of people hold their views, that's what's new. So it's not that people didn't hold, you know, creation was 24 hour, you know, seven 24 hour days or whatever it was, you know, 200 years ago. It's that it wasn't so wedded and so fervent to all the rest of how they held onto the Bible such that if, if somehow young earth creationism falls away, their entire faith, faith and, and their entire faith falls away and the Bible is false and, and all this kind of, that's what's new. Um, and then you bring in kind of creation science into it to try to undergird it. And you have the rise of creation science and all that in the, in the 1970s and after. Um, and, and so that, that, that really drives the tone of the conversation, um, not necessarily the, the views. Um, it's, it's somewhat like what happened in the heliocentric, geocentric debates. Right when, when, when Copernicus and Galileo and Kepler and they, they were having all these conversations at that time, you had you had the church making a lot of the same arguments. Can you can you point to anyone who who said who showed before us that the Bible says that the Earth orbits around the Sun? No, you can't. You're making up new things, right? All I mean, you, you have it, it. It says that the Sun rises and moves. Are you saying that you don't take the Bible serious? You had those same type of things. Well, what did we do when we found out that the science confirmed something else? We said, okay, well, we we understand that that was their view at the time, and God works incarnationally, and it was 
you know, he, he, he just described his creation from our point of view. And that's, you know, it's not hard to actually reconcile that. It was fine. Um, you know, I, I, I think that um, if it turns out that, that the earth is, is not young, you know, we, we have the same thing. I mean, God, God's incarnation. Do, do, in, do anyone today think that there's actually like a glass dome firmament that, that encompasses the earth? No, we, I mean, no, and that's fine. God, God was describing it from their terms. That's totally okay. Right. Um, so, yeah. So I, I, I just, I, I don't, I, I think that actually if the, if that, that, that can, that kind of presuppositional connection between a young earth view and, you know, the truth or falsity of the Bible, if that, as long, if that connection wasn't there, these conversations would be so much more peaceful and meaningful uh, and we would be able to, to understand each other a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree. I completely agree with that. And, and um, yeah, kind of tying back to the hermeneutical stuff a bit. I have a question for you. Like, you know, often like, I, you know, obviously Genesis is one example. Another example would be kind of like the new perspective on Paul or something like that. You know, yeah. I'm sure yeah. you aware of that conversation. Yeah, uh, yeah, I am aware of that conversation. I okay. have, uh, I mean, I, I, I somewhat, you know, not that this is the topic. I somewhat agree with D.A. Carson where where you know when he, when he was in, in engaging with uh with nt Wright, and nt Wright has has you know he really had progressed from distancing himself from um you know uh from from you know dunn and sanders and he he started saying oh well that that's not the only thing that's talking about it's just that these co this covenantal inclusion language is part of what's paul's talking about and d.a carson was like well if that's what you mean like no one cares. We all agree with that. Like if that, if that's all you meant, I wouldn't have had to write, you know, a two volume thing on variegated gnomism and second temple Judaism. Right. Like, so, so, you know, I kind of look at the new perspectives. That, that I think you're right to bring out the analogy that if you mean it as kind of this moderated soft, it's talking about covenant inclusion. Yeah. That's, I mean, we can have wonderful conversations about that. If you mean it as, you know, that that's just what salvation is and only is. And it's only about, you know, these, these, these covenant markers for the Jew, well, we're going to have some some big problems uh, in, in how that impacts it. And I think that's very similar to, to what we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking, too. It's like, yeah, I, <laughs> it's funny, because a lot of times it's like, ah, uh, yeah, I remember that stuff used to trip me up so bad. I'm like, oh, man, like, well, if N.T. Wright, and, you know, Don and all these guys are, are right on this, then, oh, no, my assurance of salvation, oh, no. Uh, vindication and union with Christ. Oh no. Oh no. You know, and like throws you in a loop, but then it's like, once people stop like barking at each other and just calm down enough to be like, okay, just like define what you mean. Yeah. Um, and when people do that, you realize you actually probably agree way more than you disagree with people yeah. because of course, like you mentioned, of course there's horizontal implications for reconciliation to God and justification. Of course, no one ever's denied that. I think if anything we got from the new perspective of Paul was just a better realization of that reality and of that, that that is a very important thing. Um, but even more so the vertical reconciliation with God and the That's justification. Right. And That's it's right. just, it's just super interesting though, that, um, how, I mean, if anything, hopefully debates has helped us clarify and nuance our positions better in order to see the common ground, because I think in the beginning, everyone's like, yeah, because NT, right. I mean, he kind of did some jerk moves on occasion where he'd just be like, oh yeah, the reformation you're going to believe this guy that had some mental issues about conscience and justification that's why this all came about the dang these guys are just all about law and guilt and it's like and it's just like but like in his like saying them things he always like it seemed like indirectly was saying that it was wrong but then like way later he's like oh no that's that's not what i meant it's like yeah. bro really like yeah. you just started this whole crap show and then like all you had to do is just say what you said earlier you know yeah yeah he did he does he's doing the same he does the same thing with the atonement too uh with uh with penal substitution it's, i mean he's he he's he's snarky he stirs the pot he's a brilliant man but he mm -hmm. you know he stirs the pot but. yeah yeah so i mean let, I'm trying to think, is there anything else you want to uh, talk about regarding um, anything else you want to continue onward with uh, what you've laid out so far? Um, I, I mean, this this is a topic, again, I've spent, um, 
I, I've spent so, so much time um, on and I have, uh, I have a ton of resources. I could, I could, I could honestly talk for, for forever on, for, on, on this. Um, but uh, no, I, th I think I've, I think I've, uh, I've laid out the position um, and, and a bunch of the, uh, the supports for it. Um, again, I, you know, I, I have a lot of, a lot of material, um, dem you know, actually going through and demonstrating the evidence and, and uh, some of the exegetical, uh, you know, cases and talking about the hermeneutics behind it and, and answering some of the objections and all that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, you know, people are like, oh, but what, what about that? Didn't, you know, didn't Jesus take um, Genesis literally, so we should, you know, I answer those types of questions, and so, uh, you know, I have a lot of a lot of literature on it. Great, yeah, yeah, man. Well, this this has been a lot of fun, and um, I mean, you definitely should come back. We we got to try to get Vincent, the fake Greg Bonson, to come on, um, even though he probably won't want to show his face because uh, he's he's a Steve Hayes wannabe. Um, I've, I've seen it, you know, you've met him. I, I I I've I've seen him a couple of times come on camera. It's rare, but right yeah. yeah yeah he's he's just kind of like a little wizard like a little five foot seven wizard you know um he's a good, he's a good guy i like him. yeah i like him a lot i i was surprised he's 23 um yeah. i That's thought he was older but but yeah, yeah. well uh, i think you know his uh jimmy his friend jimmy or is that both your guys's friend yeah yeah jim yeah necessitarian yeah jimmy jimmy stevens yes yeah 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 what are i mean i i like maybe we could do a show where we get like kind of all you guys on and talk about something you guys like to talk about that would be a lot of fun um yeah we we actually did i uh, i don't know if you if you do if you listen to there the third man uh, -huh. uh i mean we we just we did that recently uh me vincent jimmy uh our friend colton um uh and dave uh hopped in at the very end um and we were we were going through kind of a a review of a review of when um, a couple of open theists did a review of a conversation I had on open theism and Molinism with with Eli Ayala, um, and so you, you know we we the we're we're in we're in common Discord circles, and so Jimmy and Bonson and and, and uh, you know we have conversations pretty not as not, not as much as we used to, but we we still have conversations pretty pretty regular. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, I, um, yeah. I listened to. Uh... I listened to a few, a few of the third man ones. Um, I didn't listen to the one you're in yet. I listened to one that you missed out on or couldn't show up for, but, yeah. um, but uh, yeah, yeah, they're, they're fun. And um, yeah, man. So, I mean, if, if listeners are interested in this topic um, I know you mentioned that you've kind of done a lot of research. Is there somewhere people can find um, all that stuff somewhere? Yeah, so um, the the my blog uh, freedthinkerpodcasts.blogspot.com. Um, I can send you a link for it. Um, I actually uh, some some time ago started doing kind of collections. Um, so you know, I have I have something like between episodes and papers and articles and stuff. I have like almost fifty stuff kind of dealing with reformed theology, and uh, so I have like a reformed theology collection. I have a you know a, a collection on Molinism. So I have like thirty something either episodes or articles or debates. Um, so same thing with with Genesis one. Uh, I have uh, I don't know twenty three or twenty four either episodes or articles or whatever um, uh, dealing with that. Uh, and so I, I I can send you the link to to that collection dealing with the, with this topic specifically. Great, and then. Um uh how about any any printed books that people would do well to look into um on this, on this topic yeah um i think uh john walton has ha, has a good book on um uh the world of genesis one um if you read uh, it, it's actually I, I mentioned it before he doesn't quite hold i think my same view of genesis one but understanding polemical theology is very important to understanding uh, my view on Genesis one, uh, and so John Currid, um, his book Against the Gods, um, is very important. If if people don't want to listen to it, uh, he actually gave like a three part lecture called Crass Plagiarism. It ends with a question mark, so Crass Plagiarism. Uh, he gave a, a kind of a um, I think it's at the Chapel series. He gave a three part lecture um, that you can find on RTS's. Um, I think it's on their. They've moved things around. I can't remember if it's in the podcast app or it's in the iTunes U. Um, one of those. If you if you look up Curid Crass Plagiarism, the link will come up. Um, he gave actually a talk 
uh, dealing with that. Um, and, and Walton gave a, a talk called uh, Reading Genesis Through Ancient Eyes. Um, and that's, so if you don't want to read his entire book, that's also a really helpful uh, lecture that he gave. Mm. Awesome, man. Well, uh, any last parting words to the listeners? Um, uh, no, I, I, I think it's, you know, I, I, if they haven't already kind of like thrown the computer out the window, they're probably in a, they're probably in a, <laughs> you know, in a, in a state where they're open to having these conversations. Um, and I think it's really important, you know, I, I, you know, I've always said that, like I've, like I've said, you know, I talked to a bunch of my friends who are who are young earth and old earth creationists, uh, you know, Steve Schramm and, and Francis Turton. I have, I have kind of uh, on my blog, I have conversations and, and, and we're, where we've had rejoinders and, and stuff like that. Um, I think it's just important to have these conversations to try to understand each other's view better. Uh, I'm not trying to get people to like, I mean, hopefully, you know, I would love more people to, to hold a position like mine because I think it's accurate. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm not out here trying to say like, hey, you have to agree with me or you're dumb or you're, you know, you're, you're not taking the Bible seriously or anything like that. Um, I think it's just an important conversation to have in that. Um, and, and part of that is, you know, if you kind of pull back the curtain, part of that is, is my interest in apologetics and dealing with atheists. Um, and I think that this, this battle over creation evolution has really mired down the ability for a lot of Christians to evangelize and have good discussions with atheists because when they've left the church, they've left thinking to be a Christian, I have to hold this young earth view or I have to hold this old earth view. Um, and so for them, um, you know, it, it really, it, you know, for, or I should say for me, it really is um, it, it important to have these types of conversations where if we can be understanding of each other's views, you know, uh, and, and, and welcome each other and be loving to each other, um, that might go a long way in our evangelistic efforts uh, as, as well. So. Awesome. Well, yeah, for the listeners, you know, you can trust Tyler. He is a Presbyterian, uh, not, not PC USA. Uh, Definitely you know, not. he's, he's not out here, uh, you know, styling with a bunch of nonsense. So I, I, you know, I really appreciate it, man. I, this is definitely food for thought and I tend to like naturally just kind of like, yeah, that makes way more sense than pretty much anything I've heard so far. So I appreciate it personally. Um, because I've, I've listened to like, you know, Eli and he had Walton and, and, um, uh, Lyle on and stuff. Uh, one pet peeve, uh, I'll, I'll close out with is just like, the constant, um, oh, it's uh, like people's interpretation of the Bible. Is, it's just what the Bible says. It's like, no, this, it's your interpretation of what the Bible is saying. And that stuff always has driven me off the wall with yeah. uh, with young earth uh, literalist. And hey, man, if dispensational theology wasn't a thing, we wouldn't have these issues, you know? So yeah, well, we, may, we still might have some of the issues, but it probably wouldn't be as heightened in, in some of that. that right. Way. But I mean, I, and I got to tell you, I mean, I, I've gotten some of the, the same type of, of very, very, uh, you know, presuppositional young earth from reform brother. I mean, I got, I got uh, removed from a Facebook group uh, simply because I said, I'm not a young earth creationist. Um, and it was, you know, I, it was just a reformed group, uh, you know, um, it, it, I, it, we didn't even have a conversation. It was just, you know, I, I, I just said, well, you know, I don't, I don't affirm young earth creationism. And you know, banned from the group. So, you know, it's, it's not just in, in dispensational, um, dispensational circles. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. I just meant more of their, their methodology, like the very literal take on things, you know? Um, but yeah, that's, that's interesting. So do you, before you leave, do you hold like in theory to a young or old earth? Like, so you said you're not a young earth. Do you just implicitly mean because you take your view that you hold and you don't really care about the yeah, so so what I say is that Genesis one, I don't think is even about that. So the age of the Earth, I think, is just purely a scientific question, and I I haven't studied it. So uh, I mean, it, it's it's like it's like asking me like how many moons orbit the you know the first planet orbiting Alpha Centauri. I I don't know. Like I no. I haven't I haven't studied it. Uh, I'm I, I someone probably knows, but not me. Um, yeah. I said, so I, I, you know, I know that I know the general trend among scientists is that it's old. Um, I also, you know, I take the general trend among scientists on all kinds of things. And, and, you know, is it true? I, I mean, 
maybe they, they could be proven false. I mean, we, we believe that I, I just, I just don't, I, I just don't, I, you know, I don't, I don't hold like any type of really strong view on it. You know, if someone held a gun to my head and was like, what do you think? I'd be like, I, I don't know, probably old. Cause that's what, what most people in science seem to think. But if someone held a gun to my head and said, you know, how many, how many planets are there in the solar system? I'd be like, I don't know, probably eight or nine, depending on how you classify. Could there be more and we've missed it? Sure. Could there be, you know, I, I, you know, there, there's just a certain sense where it's like, I, you know, it just doesn't really impact my day to day. And if, it, you know, if you held a gun, I'm probably going to go with the majority of science just because I think people, you know, they're not dumb, but, but that yeah. has nothing to do with how, what I think the Bible says. And it's, it has nothing to do with how I read the Bible. Hmm. yeah yeah well great stuff tyler man and uh so yeah this is written revelation podcast where we seek to make god's revelation our foundation until next time god bless